Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Money Matters Top Tips for Success, where each and every day I bring on new business owners, entrepreneurs, and executives and have them share their top tips for success with you. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at Ask Adam Torres. You can keep up with my book releases, book tour schedule, signings, all that other good stuff. And if you'd like to apply to become a co-author of one of my upcoming books, just head on over to the website, moneymatterstoptips.com, and click on Become an Author to Apply. All right, so today I have Gail Tolbert on the line, and she is a certified executive coach over at John Matone Intelligent Leadership uh, Certified Coach, and also a founder over at Outside the Box LLC, and I am proud to announce this is a very special episode because Gail um, has chosen to become a co-author in one of the upcoming books, um, Money Matters, Top Tips for Success, Business Leaders Edition, Volume 2, uh, and her chapter was titled, Six Behavioral Competencies That Separate Today's Successful CEOs from the Pack. So first, Gail, um, congratulations on being chosen for the book. Great. Thank you so much, Adam. I am super excited to, you know, kind of, you know, finally see this come to fruition. It's, it's very, it's very exciting for me and I appreciate the opportunity. So Gail, um, one of the, one of the reasons you were chosen is because of this extensive HR background you have. I mean, you've worked in HR for quite some time. You've worked with big organizations. You've worked with small organizations. And when you were pitching your angle and talking about, you know, successful um, habits or successful competencies that, uh, that make CEOs succeed, I'm like, for me, it was a no-brainer. It's like, yeah, we, we need this content. It's going to be a great addition to the book. Um, so, Gail, first off, let's just to get started, uh, what, what was your inspiration for this? Well, Adam, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I had lots of inspiration for this chapter because, really, it, it's something that has sort of stuck out from, you know, the, I guess, from just what happens in every single organization. I feel like in every organization that I have been in over the past you know, 20 plus years that one of the things, if not the thing that makes the biggest difference is the CEO. And I've had great opportunities to work with many CEOs and really just started to see the difference in the dynamics of the organization purely based on how the CEO operates. And so for me, like this was just, a, a no-brainer for me in regards to, you know, what is most important that I can that I can talk about and, and pass along, you know, to others in business. And so for, for everybody listening, this is definitely going to be a spoiler episode, as all of my book author um, episodes are, just throwing <laughs> it out there. I still, I still want you to go buy the book, of course, go on Amazon, buy the book, but we're definitely going to do some spoilers here. Um, so, Gail, let's start off with, I know you come up with, with six different things um, that you attribute to these really successful, high-performing um, CEOs. Let's go through a couple of them. So uh, let's start sure, with uh, empo sure. empowering others. Let's start with that one. Okay, great. Um, so empowering others. And, you know, I, I chose this one as the, as actually the first, the first one I mentioned, you know, for several reasons. Uh, you know, success is about being able to empower others to find their own success. And it's one of the hardest lessons, I think, that new managers, new CEOs or whatnot, um, you know, learn and, and most of them the hard way, right? Because you want to put yourself out there as I have control, I'm a leader, I'm in charge. And when you do that, your mindset is generally, and so I like things the way I like them done. And I want the credibility for it, and, you know, I'm really just trying to show that I belong in this position. But what I've learned over time, and as you can see, leaders who kind of mature into that role and, uh, you know, definitely, as I point out in this chapter, good leaders, you know, what they learn mm -hmm. is, is that your role is – not necessarily about your success or, or the way you define your own success is not necessarily the way you would think 
it would be. Um, you know, great success is honestly as a leader is creating opportunities for others to succeed and watching them succeed. I mean, I can't think of, you know, any better feeling, right, than knowing that you have put somebody in a position um, to be successful and to launch them to whatever that next that next phase is. So, um, you know, again, so it's, it's up first and foremost. And really, you know, I give some tips, but I, I think that I'll highlight a couple. Uh, I think first of all and foremost is I say find the smartest, most talented people possible and then set them loose to create. You know, so what I mean by that is give them all the tools necessary, right, to come in. You know that you've hired the right talent, so you've got the right skill sets in place. But then, you know, make sure you onboard them properly and give them what they need in order to be successful without having to be dependent on you uh, for, you know, any great length or period of time. Um, so that is that is huge. And then the other one I'll point out is, and I think it's one that we, we all kind of lose sight of sometimes, and that is you've got to define for your people in order to empower them, you've got to define what you mean by maximum performance, right? If you're asking somebody to perform at a certain level, it could mean something completely different to you you know, than it does to your to your employee or to your team. And so you've got to make sure when you're thinking about this process of empowering others is make sure that you are defining what it is, but then also lending your support of that effort, right? And that, that you as a leader are not just leaving them out to hang out and dry, but they want you to do, you know, want you to do your work, right? But I'm here to support you. Right. And um, should you need that guidance and help? That's awesome. Um, let's uh, let's let's explore another one of these, because um, I mean, okay. it's so good. Fantastic. There's just six of them and we're not going to we're obviously not going to go through all six today because we want we don't want to go spoil. out and, but we want, oh. want people to go out and buy this book. Of course, uh, <laughs> let's go. Let's yeah. talk about uh, let's talk about a strategic mindset. Um, so I, I love okay. this. this is one of my favorite points you make, please. Oh, great. Thank you. Well, it's actually, if you, if you can't tell by the the length of <laughs> of this one uh, in the chapter, it's, it's because, you know, this is one that, that speaks to me so readily, and I, and I have spent so much time specializing in this piece. Um, so strategic mindset. So strategic is a word that as I think we, we all see out there uh, just in regular culture and in the world that has become so overused. And, you know, successful CEOs don't just say that they're strategic. They actually embody the actions of what it means to be strategic. And not just once a year or three times a year or when they're sitting in a board meeting or whatever, when it seems appropriate, you know, it means truly having a strategic mindset day in and day out. And the reason, one of the main reasons this is so important is because you actually help yourself, right? You put yourself in a, in a better position of strength by not having to make so many reactive decisions, um, down the line, right? I mean, you're going to have reactive decisions as a CEO. That just it's the nature of the beast. However, if you are truly operating with a strategic mindset on a daily basis, you are cutting down on the number of reactive decisions that you need to make. So uh, as an example, and here's a couple of things that that I believe go towards promoting this kind of daily effort of strong strong strategic mindset. Um, so, and this is one that a lot of people think, well, yeah, we do that, but you have to really think through it and think, do, do we really do this? Um, and that is really clearly defining and communicating the long-term vision to everyone in the company. Um, and with the focus that it's, it's not about the goal necessarily, but it's about the journey, right, that we're going to take to get there. 
um, I think if you if you instill that into your workforce, it makes every day meaningful and not just it's only going to be meaningful if we reach this goal. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that we kind of lose sight of day to day. Um, I also think that, you know, one thing that, and it, it's so funny because you see it in every book about how to be strategic, but yet in the organizations that I've been in, I really haven't seen many leadership teams do this, and that is, you know, engaging a leadership team in a SWOT analysis or, in other words, you know, really digressing into strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And, you know, it's an exercise, right, that the frequency kind of depends on, you know, what kind of business you're in. It may make sense to do it once a year. It may make sense to do it every six months. So it it really just depends. Um, But the purpose really is to get, you know, managers thinking about everything that could potentially impact the success of the company or, you know, if you're coming out with a new product line or, you know, you're making some extreme changes to your business. So, you know, as we all know, if, if you don't look at everything that might be coming against you, right, and, and even opportunities, right, you, it could really lead you down a wrong path in making poor business decisions. And I see a lot of companies – really not looking outside their four walls to say, you know, what's coming, right? And what, you know, how do we need to be positioned, you know, in order to, you know, and this is one of those points to go back to my first point, not react, right, to things coming down the pipeline. And instead it's like, oh, we already talked about that. And here's what we said we were going to do. Right. If if this circumstance were to come into play. So it's really just setting your company up to, you know, to be able to to be proactive. Right. And to be able to come from a position of strength, um, you know, versus versus, you know, just just kind of throwing caution to the wind and whatever comes about. You just then you're like, oh, we'll make a decision when that happens. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so that's that's you know really that's a good chunk. Um, and the only other thing I'll mention, I think, because it is a big part of the strategic mindset, and I spend some time talking about it in the chapter, is uh, really about values. Um, values are coming back very big into the workplace. They they started out as a big concept, you know, back when I started in HR, which I won't mention the year. Um, I will date myself, but we don't need to do that. Um, but then, then they kind of took on a uh, just as a, oh, we need to have values, right? And we're going to put them out there. But I feel like almost every company I've been in, they don't, they have them, but they don't use them, right, for the purpose that they're intended to be used for. And what I mean by that is, so they're the heart of the organization, right? And so when you're done right, like they create, they create this glue, like this stickiness internally. And, you know, you're giving meaning to your employees. You know, I, I've seen increased productivity with employees, you know, externally with customers. You know, customers, like if you're competing against somebody in the marketplace, you know, Customers may look for companies, you know, that align with their values, right? They may, mm-hmm. you know, there, there are things that are important out there that sometimes we don't realize. You know, they want to feel good maybe about their partnership with a company that has a purpose. And so, therefore, they're less likely also to move their business elsewhere, just like you would retain employees, uh, you know, more often – if you're connecting your values. So I, I guess if you, if you kind of put it down to, for briefly for a moment, for, to a granular level, it, you have to involve your employees in the mm-hmm. process. I've seen so many companies 
either two people come up with the values or it's just the leadership team. And in my experience, I have not seen that be effective. For it to really be effective, you have to, you know, you have to get your your employee base engaged. So you want to maybe form a project team, you know, representatives that come from every part of the company, and you let them lead that value creation process. Uh, I've found that when that happens, you know, it really, they do really feel bought in. And, and then it's easier to weave those values through the organization, which is the next step, right, is, is putting them into every part of your operation from hiring to performance management, you know, to even to exiting the organization, um, how you communicate, all of those things. And when that happens, I, I, it ultimately, and I have, I've seen statistics, don't have them with me right here, but that have shown that it acts, absolutely impacts the bottom line for companies. So I get on my soapbox about that, but that's, that's, that's awesome. a, that's a big part. A strategic mindset. Let's talk a little bit about your. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what. And this makes perfect sense. I mean, you've been in HR for many years. You've uh, you've worked in that capacity and and in other capacities with these high performing CEOs and other CEOs that you've helped. And now um, you've been working as a um, as an executive coach. So to me, it, it just makes perfect sense. You've been doing this work the whole time. Now you want to also um, be able to help people um, individually in terms of organizations or entire organizations for that matter. Um, talk a little bit. Absolutely. More about your coaching, your coaching business, and how you're helping these high performance leaders do even better. Yeah, uh, so you know, again, you're you're right. Like it, it, it made perfect sense, and I coaching is is something that I, I've always done indirectly throughout my career, and I think I had enough people say to me over time, you know, gosh, Gail, you should really like coaching would be perfect for you. And so when I was looking for that next, you know, where do I go? I've, I've kind of accomplished what I wanted to accomplish from the standpoint of, of corporate HR. Uh, you know, where do I want to make an impact? And what am I passionate about so that, you know, I can be you know, excited about, about moving forward and really make a difference. And so uh, with all these experiences, that's how, you know, coaching executives came about. And in addition to that, because I really narrowed this niche in, uh, because, again, it's, it goes even more so to uh, something I have struggled with over my career, and it's a big topic still today, is women in leadership. And, you know, as you know, I've worked mostly in technology companies, so there have been many times when I have been the only female sitting at the table. And women in general, as we shown, have have a lower confidence level, right? And so they don't necessarily sometimes step up to the plate and be vocal about their opinions and ideas when they really should because they have great ideas just like anybody else does. And so it really it really started to make sense to me to say, hey, not only do I want to coach executives, but I'd like to narrow that down to, I want to coach, you know, women executives who are kind of at that director level and up, uh, technology companies who are kind of feeling stuck, right, in the level where they are. And for whatever reason that may be, you know, because their confidence uh, is low or they're they're not sure at the direction where they are in their life, you know, how far they want to go in their career. And really just how do I have presence? Right. And how do I how do I communicate, you know, my stronger points and how do I I guess just feel like I'm becoming part of you know, that group that's sitting around the table. So it's it's I've had, you know, a lot of ups and downs with that in my career. And as you, you know, as we've talked about, you learn 
uh, from all the mistakes <laughs> that you make. And I've often thought, gosh, I wish I had that person back then, you know, who at least could have given me a little bit of guidance and probably caused me to crash and burn a little bit less <laughs> than I did. Um, so that's really, that's kind of the inspiration for what, for what I do. Um, and then I'll, I'll just say that, you know, the organization that I found that really kind of embodied, uh, kind of the concepts in leadership that I was looking for was John Matone and, you know, his executive coaching program is, is just phenomenal. Um, he has been an up and comer and, and is, is getting very well known in, in the executive leadership realm. And just a really great organization for uh, just taking that, the whole executive, right, and not just who am I at work, but the whole person. And how do I show up as a, as a person better, not only as an executive, but, you know, how do I start to raise the bar for myself in some of these areas where I may not be as strong, and then how do I take these areas where I am strong and leverage them, you know, to be better in my role. Uh, so really just uh, kind of spoke to me about, you know, how do I want this approach to go? And, uh, you know, John certainly in his program has it. That's awesome, Gail. So, um, no, that's, that's an amazing thing. And so what is a normal, what is a normal, um, what does a normal engagement? So if somebody's driving in their car right now and they're thinking about it and they're like, you know, I, I like what Gail's talking about. Maybe I want to, I want to contact her to talk more about her coaching business. What, what does a normal, a typical engagement look like just so they have some type of idea like length of time? Is it a short sure. engagement? Is it years? I mean, what, what is your experience there? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, really, to get the most out of, I think, an executive coaching experience, uh, you know, it's, it is a, I'd say, you know, at the very minimum, a six to nine month commitment. And I say that because there are things that you're going to work on and develop over time. And, it's, if you really want to make these changes, you have to commit to the process. So that's the standard. I mean, the standard would be ideally probably about nine months. You know, maybe mm -hmm. you, you just tell you know, nine months to a year. Obviously, you can customize that a little bit uh, depending on the scenario. But, um, you know, it's not, I mean, there's certainly work you have to, you have to put in, to put in to the process. So I always make sure that people are really invested in doing this and mm -hmm. um, that they're, if they're working right now, that their companies are invested in doing this because you, you are going to be involving members of their team, you know, their boss. And, and so you want to make sure that this is, this is something that, is going to, you know, really be something you can commit to. That's awesome. Um, well, Gail, um, really appreciate you coming on the show today and telling us more about, obviously, what you're doing uh, in your coaching business, but also, I mean, just your chapter. It's an amazing chapter. It's, it's, um, I'm, I'm very happy to have it in the book, uh, Six Behavioral Competencies That Separate Today's Successful CEOs from the Pack. Congratulations again. Um, love having you in the book. And to the audience, as always, um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, don't forget, if you got a lot of value out of this, which I hope you did, uh, subscribe to the podcast, leave me a review, do all those great things we do to support our podcasters. I really do appreciate it. And, uh, Gail, thanks again for all you do.